Saying a system is FSMA compliant or understanding risk management frameworks can be incredibly complicated. And the documentation and the guidance put out by the federal government is incredibly cumbersome and very, very difficult to read and digest and understand how it all interrelates to each other. In this week's video, I am gonna show you exactly what you need to look at to be FSMA compliant and really how to understand implementing a risk management framework to secure your systems. Coming up. Hey everybody, how you doing? Thank you for joining us today. We've got a great episode. So the US federal government has put out a ton of research and documentation on how to properly implement information security programs. Uh, the NIST Special Pub 800 series um, is just a huge list. I mean, 50, 60, 70 um, different documents on very specific things on how to secure, you know, cloud, how to secure wireless, how to secure IoT, how to implement cryptography programs and stuff. There's just a ton of information. But within all of that, there is a guidance on how to implement a risk management framework. And that's really what the focus is of today. So if you're new to fit, you know, federal IT, you're new to cybersecurity, if you've ever like Googled what is FISMA or something like that, that's probably how you may have ended up here if you're new. Um, it's very, very confusing on how to navigate it and where to begin and what is in scope and what is not in scope and how to implement it. So we're going to be talking about that today. And really, I'm going to focus on, I, I should be throwing graphics up here. I'm going to be focusing on the NIST 837 risk management framework because that's really, um, you know, ground zero, kind of the sun of the solar system that we're going to be talking about today. So 837, and I'll provide links to all of this um, in the show notes below, but you may want to grab a pen and pause and grab a pen and paper because as I go through this, you might want to jot down which ones to look at and which uh, not to. So, and, and by the way, really quick, if you're new here, uh, this is Simply Cyber, a YouTube channel designed for helping cybersecurity professionals take their career further faster, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, all that great stuff. And if you're a regular here, thanks again so much for the support. I've been uh, just, you know, getting subscribers left and right. And it, it makes me, uh, you know, know that you guys are enjoying the content that I'm producing. So, but let's get into the actual framework. So the NIST 837 Risk Management Framework is a six step cycle or phase, it's continuous. And the whole point of it is to understand and have a uniform approach to securing federal IT. Now you can use this approach in your business at, on a system. It doesn't have to be for federal IT, but if you're seeking FSMA compliance, this is the process that you're gonna need to do. So the very first step is the categorize of the system. And all this is, so you'll hear FIPS 199, FIPS 200, these two documents, all you need to know about these two documents is that they simply say you are supposed to take a federal system or take a system and assign it some security categorization level. And those levels are only low, moderate, and high. It gets a little bit more complex than that because um, you can do tailoring and stuff like that, but we're not gonna get into that today. All you gotta know about is 199 and 200 simply says that you gotta say it's low, moderate, or high. Now, how do you decide when you do step one, is it low, moderate, or high? Take a look at 866, and this special pub 866, um, volume two. This is um, basically just a huge list of different types of data and tells you what the baseline uh, security categorization is for those types of data. So for whatever system it is, you work in healthcare, you got protected health information, look it up. You work in manufacturing and you got, um, you know, uh, like intellectual property and blueprints and stuff like that, look it up. You work in uh, a regional airport and you got like uh, communication data going on, look it up. Like no matter what it is, it's gonna be in 866 and it's gonna tell you. Now, here's a pro tip for you. I would say in my experience, 90% of systems are moderate. High is really reserved for like national security systems, classified systems, those type of things, which uh, a lot of systems you know typically aren't. And then low is used, but it's it's like uncommon. It's almost like for a system that if it became unavailable or went down or something like that, it wouldn't be a terrible burden. Uh, let's move on to step two. Step two is 
selecting the controls that you're gonna be in. Now this is NIST 800-53, which I believe is on Rev 5 right now, which is, doesn't matter, it's 853. 853 is basically, there's a ton of, uh, do, you know, document to it, but all you need to know about 53 is that that document is a huge security control dictionary. And what is that? It's, it crosses, you know, 18 different families, which are basically different kind of dimensions of information security. So there's technical controls, administrative controls, you know, there's access control, um, securing data in transit, risk assessment, uh, software acquisition, supply chain. It doesn't matter all that stuff. All you need to know is that there are hundreds and hundreds of controls in 853. So all you gotta know is get your controls for your baseline. Now remember, we're just baselining, right? So you can add other controls, you can take away other controls as you need, but for your initial push, you select the moderate ones out of 53. Plain and simple. Step three, implement the controls. Now this is the lion's share of the work, right? So. At this point, you will want to use NIST 800-18 um, is basically how to make a system security plan, but the SSP is one of the most important documents for a system, and it's basically the book that explains where all your controls are and how controls are implemented. Um, this should be, if you have any documentation on any of your system, uh, it should be in here, right? So there's gonna be a network diagram there, or a, a data flow diagram, who owns the system, what's the point of the system, all the things you would expect. And then all of the controls, which we just selected in the previous uh, step, how they're implemented, right? So you gotta talk to the IT staff, you gotta talk to HR, you gotta talk to procurement, you gotta talk to all these people, right? And figure out how you're gonna implement it. Now, if you're a smaller organization or whatever, yeah, it, it, it might be the same people and stuff and maybe, Implementing a control is as simple as saying, we use username and passwords, right? Like, you know, that's how access control, and there's only eight of us. So you don't have to like overcomplicate it for the sake of it being, you know, NIST 853 or, or you know, um, 837. You just pick your controls and you implement them. Now, when you're implementing them, if you have any challenges, right? So you, like in the 53, you've got all your controls, you're beginning to implement them, and, and you're not sure how to implement them or what it means or stuff. NIST 800 Special Pub Series has implementation guides, like I mentioned earlier, for each of those things. So like if you have wireless network and you gotta secure it as part of your, your infrastructure or your system, they have a document on how to do that. If you want, need to do um, awareness training, I think that's 860. If you need to do awareness training, right, as part of your AT control family, they have a document on how to do that and how to do it well, right? So. Everything you need is there. Now this is, like I said, this is a bit of a, a, a bunch of work, but I mean, this is how you secure stuff, right? So that's step three. And that's gonna be like step one and step two, you should be able to do in like an hour, okay? Like boom, step three, that's a big, big amount of work, but you're documenting, you're implementing and stuff like that. Step four is the, um, I don't have the document in front of me, obviously it's gonna be here, but it's, it's basically like validating the controls or testing the controls, right? And typically you would have like an independent auditor come in and validate those because testing your own controls, uh, there's a, some sus suspect uh, bias there probably, right? Um, but if you're not being audited, it's not for federal IT. Um, if this is for FISMA compliance, you will need an independent third party to audit your controls and document the findings and stuff like that. But um, the important part is auditing the controls is effectively looking at that SSP that I mentioned earlier saying, okay, these are all the controls. It makes sense based on your security baseline, which we figured out in step one, right? Um, and then you test them. You either interview users, you actually run simulations and tests like, okay, so uh, I'm going to send you a piece of malware and your, your AV or EDR client is going to catch it right? Or we're going to reset a password and make sure that you can't log in or whatever. Or So that is the audit piece. Now here's something that you don't see in the six stage thing that's critically important. And I really wish that they would uh, put, update this, but no one listens to me when it comes to this, right? So step five is authorize the system. So step three and four should take a long time. Three the most, four, you know, probably whatever, six weeks. 
Step five is simply a memo from somebody with authority saying, yes, this system is authorized to go. Like we can use it in production. Someone's owning that responsibility or that accountability. Now here's what you need to know. Between, how does that person even make that decision? Well, they look at what the results are from the audit in step four and what the, so not all controls are gonna be implemented, okay? It's just, that's a fact. You're not gonna get all your controls implemented. So whatever controls are not implemented or implemented not sufficiently to, to eliminate risk, there will be residual risk. Now, what is that residual risk? You can use NIST 800-30 which is how to conduct a risk assessment. And that's, that's an entire video and discipline all to itself. But what you need to know is, here are your controls, here are your gaps. If those gaps were exploited, what is the likelihood of them being exploited? And if that did happen, what is the impact? So simple example, right? Like you have PHI in a database, but the database isn't encrypted at rest. Okay, so what's the risk here? The risk is that someone steals the database. Okay, well, what's the likelihood of that happening? Well, based on the access control of the network and the physical security controls of the area, and um, you know, we've got audit um, detection controls to know if someone accesses the data. So the likelihood is low. What's the impact if someone actually gets that data? Well, it's high. We would get sued to the point of you know, catastrophe, we'd have to go bankrupt. Okay, so that sucks, but like, let's say you've got this high re uh, high impact and low likelihood, like there's a little, you know, crosswalk grid thing in 830, which will probably show up right there, um, that you can look at and say, okay, you know what? This is a moderate risk. Um, we, we, we've got a plan to fix it, right? We're gonna put data at rest encryption in, but we can't afford it right now. So that goes forward to the authorizing official. So they look at all those risks and this is the part that's missing, right? Like they should have a risk assessment piece there in the, um, cause when you, auth when you audit the controls, that's fine. But like, what do you do with that? You have to do a risk assessment on it to inform the authorizing official. Okay, so then the authorizing official, they get their little risk assessment and they understand what the plan is on how to fix those things in the future. Then they write like a simple one page memo. I'm the authorizing official. I've reviewed this uh, document, SSP or audit plan, and I authorize this system for production. Boom, that's it. So step, just to remind you, steps one and two should take an hour. Steps three and four should take a while, right? Like maybe three to six months minimum. And then step five is another whatever hour, right? So the AO authorize an official to read the document and then type up a one page memo. And then step six is the final step. And remember it's continuous. Step six is just to monitor the controls. And this is pretty standard. So the authorizing official is going to grant like a one year or a three year. Um, it, it, it's changed a little bit. It used to be a three year ATO authorization to operate. Um, I think it's gone down to a year, but you have to do stuff you know, annually, but it doesn't matter. The point is you basically, you don't just set it and forget it and, and go, uh, like the whole point is that information security in a program is a continuous effort. The point is that information security is a continuous effort. Now, when you come back up for a, you know, renewal or whatever, like, yeah, you would, you would say, okay, has the information changed? But in most, most, in most situations, you'll never do step one again. You'll, maybe do step two again, like where you start doing some tailoring and stuff like that, which basically means like, oh, uh, we have a moderate baseline, but like our availability needs are actually not moderate, they're low because like this system gets spun up once a year for tax returns, for example. So maybe you make that low and then, you know, some of your controls can go away and stuff like that. This, this is more like level two, day two finesse stuff for um, a secure information system. But the, the point is, um, th those are really only documents you really need to be able to get started and get FISMA compliant and understand RMF. And if you wanted to do 800-171 to be compliant with that standard, like though that, that is a far less controls that you need to implement, but it's basically the same process, right? You put these controls in place, yet you document them, you implement them, you audit them, you get someone to say that, you know, with authority that they agree to it. And there you go. So, uh, you can use this uh, for, you know, like I said, for any system or whatever, uh, and it's a good start. If you're working on federal grants or something, some, if anything says like um, FISMA compliant or FedRAM compliant 
or anything like that. This is the process that you need to use, okay? So uh, hopefully, you know, you've, you've found it uh, useful and interesting. Check out the NIST Special Pubs. Like, the, it is a wealth of free information. It's unbelievably uh, valuable. And the trick is that, like I said, it's just cumbersome to read, which is why I wanted to make this video. So if you found this video interesting, give it a thumbs up and maybe check out some of my other videos. Uh, like I said, I cover a wide range of content, but basically I'm focusing on helping individuals within the cyber, secu cyber security community uh, go further, faster, or people who are interested in maybe getting into cybersecurity. Uh, hopefully I can, uh, in, you know, spark your passion. So I don't know. Until next week, stay secure.